Hello and welcome back to another wild camping episode. Uh, it seems it's just after Remembrance Day and being ex-military, I thought that we'd come down to the crash site and Brecon beacons of a World War II bomber that unfortunately crashed in 1944 uh, here. Um, luckily for me and you guys, Ross is doing a PhD in history, so he'll be all over that. He can tell us everything about it. Um, the plan is we'll have a look at this now, and then we're going to go further into the Brecon beacons, try and find a nice camp to spot, uh, set up fire, set up tent, and uh, get stuck into a little night of wild camping. So. Um, yeah, hope you enjoy with us and uh, let's get stuck into it. Yeah, this is the this is the crash site. It was a Wellington bomber, the RAF. It was a twin-engine medium bomber. Uh, even going into the Second World War is quite, you know, a fairly sort of outdated, antiquated aircraft. And after a few early raids against um, Nazi Germany early in the war, late '39, early 1940, uh, it was realised it was so somewhat obsolete and not really up to the task. It did partake in a number of uh, bombing raids into the war, strategic bombing with RAF Bomber Command. But uh, it just couldn't carry a heavy enough bomb load as the war went on, as it, and it was ended up being replaced by the Halifax, the famous Lancaster as well. Uh, this particular aircraft was part as a Royal Canadian Air Force. Early in the war, you'd have Royal Canadian Air Force pilots, Royal New Zealand Air Force pilots, Australian and other pilots from across the Empire and the Commonwealth. Um, but as those elements grew in size, um, they have your own dedicated squadrons of the Royal Canadian Air Force squadrons, Australian squadrons. Uh, this wasn't part of an active squadron when it went down. Obviously, no, it went down November 1944, so this is the 80th anniversary of it, um, of when it went down. So it was part of 22 uh, operational training unit. So it was a training flight. Um, it ended up having developing problems in its starboard engine, so that's the right engine. Now, obviously, this aircraft is a twin-engine medium bomb. It only had two engines, and obviously, in the 19, it was an engine for the 1930s. So it wasn't very powerful. Modern airliners today, even with just two engines, can fly perfectly well with just one engine and designed to fly with one engine. But for an aircraft of this age in the 30s, losing an engine was pretty serious. Uh, it ended up losing altitude quite rapidly. And to make matters worse, it ended up developing ice on the wings. It's November 1944 in Brecon Beacons. It's a very cold day today now, and it's uh, getting very nippy and it's getting some frost on the ground. And as it developed ice on the wings, that reduces its flight, uh, its uh, ability to fly. Its aerodynamics went down, and it went down, and eventually crashed with not having enough power and losing lift due to ice. And it came down here with um, a number of Canadian airmen going down with it and being killed, unfortunately. So yeah. And this is the memorial that was uh, set up for the crash site uh, to remember the airmen that went down. Six, six airmen, I believe, all Canadian. Uh, Twenty-two operational training unit was. Uh, a Canadian unit and uh, this was set up for the 6M and they went down on the training flight. Obviously this, as crash sites go, unless someone told you it was an, air, uh, an aircraft crash, you probably wouldn't be able to tell it was an, air, uh, an aircraft of any sort. There's not much of it left at all. Um, obviously, it was a very light bomber and it impacting the mountain, it would have broken up into many different pieces. And the only thing that's really discernible that's left is this section, which is, uh, for what I guess, is, is, is part of the wing. Definitely not part of the fuselage in any way. It's too narrow to get through. So this would be one of the wings. And that's all that's really left that you can tell. And that's the Canadian flag there. Mm -hmm. So there's a new character unlocked on the channel of Rome Outdoors and this is uh, Ella. She is nearly 10 years old. She's a gorgeous looking Mincha Schnauzer. Loves the outdoors and she's joined us on her first little wild camp tonight, don't you? So uh, everyone say hello in the comment section to Ella. She loves the camera as well, don't you? Good girl, don't you? 
even though you sometimes have a bit of an attitude and you we love you you so love you new yes <laughs> Uh, it is getting a bit colder, hence all the uh, headgear that's coming on and the gloves because my fingers are starting to go a bit numb. Um, and like I said, it is November, so the days are getting shorter. I think it's only about five o'clock in the afternoon and it is going to get quite dark now. Um, so we're going to quickly skedaddle out of here, find somewhere a bit better to camp because um, it is quite open at the minute. So somewhere a bit more enclosed, set up the tent, set up the fire and... Uh, Get Master Chef on the go of you and get some uh, food going again, is it? Yeah, so as we're approaching winter, sunlight is just going so much faster. So um, yeah, we're quickly running out of sunlight at the minute. Um, so the plan is we're going to wild camp in this spot, but um, trust me, we've had a good one. Look at this little spot here. Yeah, so we've got the higher ground here. I'm going to quickly set up the tent now, just while we've got a bit of sunlight, which is probably the best thing to do when you're wild camping, because again, you want to sort of arrive late and leave early. Um, so we get the tent up now, get the camp going, and just get some food. I'm so hungry, I can't wait some food. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, Ella's on the dog biscuits tonight, but um, yeah, we don't want to be ill in the middle of the night in the tent, because that won't be fun for anyone, and it'd probably be like a bloody episode of in between us, right? So uh, yeah, sorry, Ella, you're on the dog food. That is the tent, ladies and gents. Somewhat an angle because there's loads of stone in the ground, so we've had to peg it to the right slightly. Uh, because, yeah, just couldn't get the peg in really and into a certain place, I think, because there's so much uh, stone underneath the grass. Um, so it does look a bit wonky, but it's suitable, awesome, and ready to go. So uh, let's show Ella a new home, is it? Go on, Ella. Let's have a look. Now, in you go. In you get in your house. <laughs> go on, Ella, in you, in you go. Ella, do you want to go house? I don't think she wants to go in. That's going to be a problem. Well, you want to stay outside, is it, Ella? <laughs> oh, there, there she, is. she is. What's in there? That's it. Go on, go. Have a look. No. no. <laughs> She's outside. <laughs> yeah, she won't be saying the same as we're cold or later, will she? No. We just got to uh, go to Ramsey and his... Uh, Secondary chef Ella setting up the uh, cooking equipment here. 
Ella, not too sure. I'm sure she will be sure when there's uh, some burgers on the menu now. So Ross, we usually have gourmet burgers. Just double checking, what's on the menu today? Gourmet burgers. <laughs> we will spice it up in other videos. I'm just getting acquainted with cooking in general, well alone cooking outdoors. Yeah, we're not, we don't really cook that much at home either, do we? We're pretty poor cookers. Yeah. Uh, cookers, chefs. But um, yeah, we will get better menus. I know we see a lot of Wild Captain channels and they have some pretty good food on the go, which we will do. Um, like, I want to get a steak on the go already. Imagine a steak out here, that'd be class. We will cook, this will be, this will be good to cook a steak on, I think, a little steak. So we'll definitely do steaks at some point. But I'll get some cutlery and stuff for that. So, um, yeah, we'll definitely do something like that. Yeah, so I hope you can see me now. Um, it has got really dark. We just had some food. Uh, burgers hit the spot. Ale is fed, and I think we're all ready to go to bed. It is uh, getting really cold now. Um, the weather's dropped significantly. The wind is picking up as well. I don't know if you can hear on the mic, but um, yeah, I think it's time to get, get away from the fire. It's just still quite cold next to the fire now, and uh, get it warmed up in that sleeping bag um, before we get too cold. And uh, yeah, just chill out in there. So that's a bit of the difference I think between the wild camps in the summer and the winter. You just got to get into your into your shelter, into your tent uh, a lot earlier. Um, otherwise, you will get cold, and it probably will be quite hard to warm up. Um, and that's not what you want on the top of the mountain when you're miles away from sort of anyone else or any sort of shelter. So yeah, we'll do the smart thing here: get in the tent, get warmed up, and uh, have a cut with the dog. So uh, I'll see you guys in the morning. Yes, yeah, the morning now. Um, I just come a bit away from camp because Ross is sleeping. Uh, just have a chat. Uh, it's quite clear morning, so I'm happy about that. It's freezing, though, it's so cold, but it's nice. Um, even though it is quite crisp, it is nice, okay? So, uh, yeah, before the sun gets up properly now, we're going to get out of here and uh, get back home, get back in the car, get uh, Ella back in the doggy bed, I think. So, um, yeah, thank you for watching. If you've uh, enjoyed, uh, please like, subscribe, really appreciate it. Um, and please, yeah, just follow us for the rest of the journey because um, there's plenty more to come from, okay? So, thank you very much. I'll see you guys later. Scale in the back. Go on, else. In you get. Jump. Mm, no. <laughs> you want to go, go back and camp again, is it? <laughs> want another light? Want another night? One more. Uh, no more for Ella.